think it's terribly important to start off and understand that that's a symbol. If you take the United States trade deficit for 1986, it was $170 billion. Only $60 billion of that was with Japan. If Japan had disappeared off the face of the earth and we had made for ourselves everything the Japanese made for us, we still would have had a trade deficit of $110 billion. And that would have been the largest trade deficit any nation has ever had in human history, except for the United States one year earlier. What that means is the reason we talk a lot about Japan is to become a symbol of a much bigger issue. What I want to talk about is that bigger issue. And I'm going to talk in the context of Japan, but I want it very clearly understood that what we're going to talk about tonight doesn't just relate to Japan. It relates to the whole world. The Japanese argue that we're racist when we talk about Japan because on a per capita basis, the Germans have a trade surplus twice as big as that of Japan. Taiwan has a trade surplus on a per capita basis much bigger than that of Japan. And Canada has a trade surplus on a per capita basis bigger than that of Japan. And what the Japanese say is, why are you screaming at us rather than those other countries? Now, I don't think it's because the United States is a racist country and doesn't like yellow people. I think it's basically because Japan is a very big country. They clearly are our major industrial competitor, and they have become a symbol of this bigger issue. The bigger issue is how does the United States compete in the world economy? And Japan is only the way we talk about that problem. And how we compete with Japan is a code word for how do we compete with the world. Now, if you think about it in that context, I want to start off at a particular place. The place I want to start off with is something that's going to sound a little harsh. Basically, the right way to think about the problem and the right place to start is with the idea that the American economy has died. And it's been replaced by a world economy. Now, you read the books on death and dying. If you read the books on death and dying, it says that every human being goes through a couple of stages. The first thing you do is you go to the doctor and he says, terminal cancer, what do you do? You say, thank you, doc, but I'm going to consult a different doctor. You go through the denial stage. If you listen to Ronald Reagan's State of the Union message a year ago in February, he said something that sounded so good I wanted to stand up and cheer in my living room. It just didn't happen to be true. What he said was, America can outmarket, outproduce, and outsell any other country in the world. But, of course, with a $170 billion trade deficit, the truth is precisely the opposite. The rest of the world can outmarket, outsell, and outproduce the United States. But President Reagan is in the denial phase. It ain't true. We're still John Wayne, and we win all the time. The second stage, after you get through denial, is it's unfair. I'm being treated unfair. You know, I have never lost a fair fight in my life. Every time I lose, it's unfair. I remember a few years ago when Motorola and Bethlehem Steel used to have those ads about having a level playing field. I can assure you that the last thing in the world that Bethlehem Steel wanted with Nippon Steel was a level playing field. Because on any level playing field, Bethlehem Steel gets beaten. Bethlehem Steel wanted a playing field very sharply tilted in their favor because that's the only possible way they could win competing against Bethlehem Steel. And, of course, the Japanese are not winning by cheating. They're winning by working hard and producing very good products. That's how the Japanese have a trade surplus of $70 billion a year, not by sneaky or cheating. And it's very important to understand that. Now, two things have happened that have led to the death of the American economy. Now, these are both things which I think most Americans know, but there's a difference between knowing something in your head and knowing it in your stomach. And it isn't until you push that knowledge from your head to your stomach that you really start to take action on it. And so one of the things I want to do at the moment is push knowledge from your head to your stomach. The first dimension upon which the world has changed, and it's very important to understand this, in the 1950s and the 1960s, you and I competed based on effortless economic technological superiority. We did not compete based on price of our products. We competed on having products that the rest of the world didn't have. For example, take the competition in 1956 between the Boeing 707 and the British Common. The Boeing had a nice advertising slogan. The reasons which probably had to do with metal fatigue but were not crystal clear then or now, periodically all the rivets in the British Common that was up in the air just gave up and the whole plane disintegrated. The 
Boeing 707 was sold on the ground. Our plane flies and his plane doesn't fly. That's a very powerful selling slogan. <laughs> Boeing didn't have to argue, we have a cheaper plane than the British. That was an irrelevant consideration. By the time you get to 1986, the world is different. The United States no longer has that effortless technological superiority. Let's think about semiconductor chips. Ten years ago, we were making 8K RAM chips. American firms had 90% of the market. Today, we're making 256K RAM chips. Japanese firms have 90% of the market. The next semiconductor chip coming out is the mega chip, the million K RAM chip. It is highly likely that there will be no American open market producer. It looks like AT&T and IBM will make some for themselves, but no American company will try be trying to sell mega chips vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese in world markets. So in a 10-year period of time, we will get completely pushed out of the semiconductor market. Now, that's not a rust belt industry. That's America's high technology future that we're being pushed out of. Because the simple fact of life at the moment, which is very difficult to understand, in some industries, America is ahead. In some industries, America is behind. But on average, America is average. America no longer has that technological leadership vis a vis the rest of the world. And you can see it in many places. But it's very important to understand that that's true. From now on, you and I will compete based on the price and quality of our products. We will not compete based on having products which the rest of the world does not have. The second dimension is even more important than the first dimension. And that is, in American economic history, we have been in the world, but never really of the world. Because the United States participated very little in world trade. If you go back to 1929, if you looked up the data, you would find that America exported or imported about 5% of the GNP. World trade was a very small tail on a very big economic dog. Jump forward 20 years to 1949 and look up the data, the United States is still exporting or importing 5% of the GNP. Nothing has changed. Jump forward another 20 years to 1969, America is still exporting or importing a little bit more than 5% of the GNP. Nothing has changed. But between 1969 and 1986, a revolution occurs. By 1986, the United States is importing 14% of the GNP. Now that includes government, hospitals, all kinds of things that you can't import. You know what fraction of the GNP the Japanese export? The answer is 17. We are almost as much dependent on international trade as the Japanese. The only difference is they know it and we don't. Now, the other day in Boston, a reporter for the Boston Globe went into Jordan Marsh, which is the largest department store chain in Boston, and they counted labels. And they claimed that if you just closed your eyes and grabbed, you had a 55% probability of grabbing, grabbing a foreign-made product. And more than half of all the things for sale in the biggest department store chain in Boston weren't made in America. That's a different world. It's a very different world from just a few years ago. The United States, for the first time, depends on world trade for its standard of living. And we have those technologically equal competitors. Now, if you're in that period when you go through denial and it's unfair, what's the next stage? After you've decided you really have cancer, whether it's unfair or not is really irrelevant, you have it, what's the next thing every human being does? You go to Mexico for liatrol. The magic, easy answer that will solve all the problems. And Lyotrol, in this case, is the idea that the American economy could give up on manufacturing and become the service economy. And that's a Lyotrol that not just Americans take, but the rest of the world takes. Because from the point of view of Japan, it's very comforting to think that that could be true. Because that means Japan can make all the world's manufactured goods, and it never has to worry about losing its American market because Americans will pay for those manufactured jobs goods by exporting services. Now, the only people who think that that lateral exists are people who never looked at the data. If you look at the creation of jobs over the last 10 years, it kind of looks like the service revolution because 60% of all the jobs that have been created in America in the last 10 years have in fact happened in services. If you look at the details as to where those jobs are, you'll very quickly come to the conclusion that it isn't going to last. 
what you will find when you look up the data, you will find that 40% of all those millions of jobs have been created in healthcare, mostly in nursing homes. Now let me tell you a simple fact of life. Americans cannot have a high standard of living giving each other heart transplants, no matter how nice the heart transplant is. And in fact, we have upped the percentage of GNP in healthcare from 6 to 12% in the last 15 years. We're not going to go to 24% in the next 15 years. And the minute we cap healthcare spending, and I think that's what we're going to do, because we have to do it, 40% of the growth in services will disappear overnight. Another 35% of all the growth in services, making 75% in total, comes in the category the government calls business and legal consulting. We've upped the number of lawyers in America from 200,000 in 1970 to 775,000 in 1986. Another fact of life. Suing each other between consenting adults is good clean fun, but it doesn't generate a high standard of living. Because if I don't shovel my sidewalks, you fall down and break your leg, and you sue me, all we do is redistribute income. You can take some of my income away from me, but we don't make the American GNP and per capita income any bigger. And there again, we're not going to cripple the number of lawyers every 15 years. At some point in time, we've got enough lawyers, even in America, and the number of legal lawyers, accountants, economists and people like that quit growing. Now, even more to the point, if you go off and look at the American balance of payments and you just glance at it and you don't look at the details, it will look like the United States exports more services than it imports. But before you jump to that conclusion, you should look at the details. For a series of accounting reasons, all of the American earnings on foreign assets that we own abroad are counted as a service export. So when we earn interest on General Motors West Germany, we count that as a service export, which is really not. What we pay to the rest of the world, we put in a different place in the balance of payments. So the first thing you have to do is take these financial flows out of the service accounts. And then for reasons which I'm not sure why it is done, all exports of American military hardware are counted as service exports. Now, somebody has suggested that's because American military hardware breaks down a lot and needs a lot of service. <laughs> but if you strip the military out of services and you strip investment income out of services, in 1985, we exported $55 billion worth of service. But we imported $410 billion worth of goods. There is no conceivable way you can expand service exports to the rest of the world by enough to pay for the goods that America wants to buy. What's worse than that, in 1985, you know how many services we imported? $58 billion worth. We had a slight deficit in our service accounts because in many forms of services, Americans aren't particularly good at them. What's the insurance capital of the world? Well, it's called Lloyd's of London. So when it comes to the transactions in insurance, we owed the British $3 billion more than anybody paid us and so we had a $3 billion deficit in insurance transactions. Did you notice the recent Fortune article on the 10 largest banks in the world? The Daiichi Congo Bank has just passed Citibank to become the world's largest bank. World's 10 largest banks, one American, two French, and seven Japanese. What would you bet on? A set of banks backed up by a 21% personal savings rate or a set of banks backed up by a 4% personal savings rate? What banks inherit the world? The country that's the world's biggest lender. It is highly likely, and it is already happening in the London market, that the Japanese banks will drive the American banks out of business, just like the Japanese automobile companies have put a lot of heat on the American automobile companies. And in London last year, neutral turf, the Japanese banks did 60% of the business, and the American banks did 30% of the business. In that neutral area, we were already being outscored two to one by the Japanese financial institutions. When it comes to services, if there's something wrong with American manufacturing so we can't export it, then the same thing's wrong with American services because they're produced by the same society, the same culture. Now, let's think about this economy. See, at the moment, something is going on which I would argue to you is the economic equivalent of the astronomer's black hole. This is something that will affect both Japan and the United States very fundamentally. If you think of a black hole, there are two characteristics. First characteristic, if you get into it, not even light can get out of it. 
So the farther you get in, the harder it is to get out. The second characteristic is once you're in a black hole, all of the physical principles we know about change. The pressures are so intense that physics, as we know it, in the rest of the universe doesn't exist. There's a completely different physics, we believe, inside that black hole. Now, economically, the American trade deficit or the Japanese trade surplus, because remember, they're mirror images of each other, are the economic equivalent of that astronomer's black hole. That trade deficit or trade surplus is going to completely change the world economy. And it's going to completely change the world economy in a ways in which are not completely attractive to either Americans or Japanese. Let me see if I can make that argument clear. It's terribly important as an economist when you're thinking about these international problems to say what we don't know and what we do not know. This is one of those areas where there are two things we know absolute certainty and one thing we are certain we don't know. The first thing that we do know is that no country can forever run a trade deficit. That's not an economic forecast. That's a statement of algebraic. Because to run a trade deficit, you must borrow the money from the rest of the world to finance it. We are borrowing money to pay for our trade deficit. At some point in time, the United States will have borrowed so much money, the rest of the world will not be willing to lend us that amount of money. And even if it was willing, it wouldn't have the right amount because the compound interest on the debts eat you alive. 1982, the United States was the world's largest net creditor nation. If you took everything that Americans owned abroad and subtracted everything that foreigners owned in the United States, we were left with $150 billion worth of assets. End of 1986, we were the world's largest net debtor nation. If you take everything that foreigners owned in the United States, subtract everything that Americans own abroad, foreigners own $250 billion more in the United States than we own abroad. We already have international debts twice as big as that of Brazil. Now, there is a limit on the United States borrowing just like there is a limit on Mexican borrowing. We're wealthier and we can borrow a lot more money, but we cannot borrow an infinite amount of money. And at the point in time when the rest of the world chooses not to lend us any more money, the United States trade deficit will disappear. It will disappear because the dollar will fall to the point where Americans no longer can afford to buy imported goods. Think about what happened in Mexico. August 11th, 1982, the day before Mexico goes broke, it's 12 pesos to the dollar. You know what it is today? I haven't looked it up, but it's somewhere like 1,000 pesos to the dollar. And so from a Mexican point of view, every American product is 100 times as expensive today as it was in 1982. And of course, the same thing could happen to the United States. Toyotas would be priced like Mercedes, Mercedes would be priced like Lamborghinis, and Lamborghinis would be priced like submarines. <laughs> and we would quit buying Mercedes, not because we didn't love Mercedes, but we simply wouldn't have enough income to buy them just like the Mexicans were forced to quit buying American products because they don't have enough income to buy them. So fact number one, the United States will not forever have a trade deficit. And there's a corollary to that fact. Japan will not forever have a trade surplus. Because if we don't have a trade deficit, they can't have a trade surplus. Now what has happened at the moment is both Japan and the United States, you can argue, are economic drug addicts. We both are addicted to a drug. The Japanese drug is the American market. The Japanese are building whole dedicated industries to servicing the American market, where if they could not serve, serve, sell in the American market, there isn't anywhere in the world, including Japan, where they could sell those products. Video recorders is a good example. Last year, the Japanese made 28 million video recorders. If Manhattan, Kansas was making 28 million video recorders, you'd have 640,000 people working in factories making video recorders. But they sold 16 million of those in the United States. Where in the world could the Japanese sell 16 million video recorders outside the United States, given that they already sell 7 million in the rest of the world? The answer, of course, is nowhere. And so the Japanese addiction is the American market. Now, it's not limited to the Japanese. Take Volvo and Saab. Volvo and Saab sell more than half their cars in America. Saab and Volvo are not Swedish car companies. They are American car companies that happen to make cars in Sweden. And they depend on the American market for their sales. Now, the American drug 
is that trade deficit in our standard of living. A $170 billion trade deficit is 4% of the American GNP. What a $170 billion trade deficit means is that in 1986, you and I had a consumption standard of living 4% above our production standard of living, and we didn't pay for that 4%. We borrowed the money to finance it. And so the minute the borrowing stopped, we would lose that 4% addition to our standard of living. Now, something else happens, too. At the moment, you and I are being allowed to violate what I call the first commandment of a Swiss banker. Never lend money to somebody who is borrowing money to pay interest. We're borrowing money to pay interest. When the lending stopped, we would have to start paying the interest out of our own production. $40 billion is 1% of the GNP. And so if we ended up with enough debts to pay the rest of the world $40 billion every year in interest, we would owe the rest of the world 1% of our GNP forever. Put those two things together, and we're facing something like a 5% or 6% reduction in our standard of living at some point in the future. Because we won't forever get that 5% addition to our standard of living. Second fact that, once again, we know with absolute certainty. Any country which lets itself become a net debtor nation must have a trade surplus. Because that's the only way it can earn the money to pay interest on its international debts. That's why Latin America today has to have a trade surplus. If you want Latin America to pay $15 billion a year to American banks, you have to let them have a $15 billion trade surplus, because that's the only way they can get $15 billion every year to give to your banks. What that means is we know with absolute certainty, at some point in the future, the United States is going to have a trade surplus. The corollary of that that affects Japan is any nation in the world which is a net creditor nation, and Japan is now the largest, must have a trade deficit. Because the only way in the world that people can pay you money on your loans is if you let them have a trade surplus. And so if you ever expect to be paid interest, you have to have a trade deficit. And so what that means is today, the United States has a trade deficit and Japan has a trade surplus. Tomorrow, Japan will have a trade deficit and the United States will have a trade surplus. And that's absolutely certain. Now let's talk about what we don't know. What we don't know with absolute certainty is when. Because the question is, how long will the rest of the world lend the United States money? That's a question in which there is no answer because we're on brand new financial ice. The United States is the wealthiest country in the world. How much money can the wealthiest country in the world borrow before the rest of the world gets a little nervous and quits lending? I was in Germany not too long ago talking to the head of Daimler Benz, and he said to me, when are you Americans going to quit borrowing money? My response to him was, wrong question. The right question is, when are you Germans going to quit lending money? Borrowers borrow forever. It's the lender who says no, not the borrower who says no. Now, the fact is, nobody knows. I'm going to give you three scenarios. Any one of these could be true. I don't know, you don't know, and anybody who tells you they do know is lying. Scenario number one. Suppose the world, and remember the Japanese are the biggest lender, so when we talk about the world, uh, the Japanese are a big part of it. Suppose the world were willing to lend the United States the same amount of money relative to its GNP that the world was willing to lend Mexico relative to its GNP. How much money could the United States borrow on that basis? The answer is the United States could borrow about $650 billion. At current rates of borrowing, we'll do that in about April 1989. And Ronald Reagan is going to be lucky. This is a problem for the next president of the United States. But the Mexican illustration is fascinating because sometimes we teach things in finance that are not quite true. What we often teach in finance is that you borrow more and more money, you become a riskier borrower. As the world perceives you as a riskier borrower, they raise the risk premiums on your interest rate, so your total interest rate goes up. And because you pay a higher and higher interest rate, you'll eventually get squeezed out of the market because you can't afford to pay that interest rate plus risk premiums. If you look at the Mexican case, that's not how it occurred. The interesting thing about Mexico is in June and July of 1982, it was borrowing money at the standard interest rate, which was 300 basis points above the London Interbank borrowing rate, what's called LIBRA. On August 7th, a group of Texas banks lent Mexico a billion and a half dollars at the standard interest rate. On August 13th, 
Mexican group could not borrow a peso anywhere in the world in any industry. If there wasn't a scintilla of evidence in the financial markets that the window was about to slam down. Now you might say, well, that's just a group of Texas banks. Surely the sophisticated people knew something was happening. Last summer I was doing some consulting with Credit Suisse. That's not a group of te Texas banks. And Credit Suisse confessed to me that they lent Mexico $50 million 60 minutes before they went broke. They did not have a scintilla of evidence that something had gone wrong in Mexico. <coughs> That's just the gnomes of Zurich. And if the gnomes of Zurich don't know, you ain't going to know. Now what's going to happen in the American case? As we borrow more and more money, are we going to be seen as riskier and riskier and have to pay higher and higher interest rates so that everybody sees what's coming? Or is it going to be like Mexico? One day you borrow, the next day the bank is closed. I don't know, and you don't know either. Second scenario. Suppose the world would treat us like they treated Chile. Chile was allowed to borrow 130% of its GNP. If we could borrow 130% of our GNP, we could borrow $6,000 billion. And even at current borrowing rates, we won't do that until about 2015, and we've got 30 years of a great party ahead of us. <laughs> well, we can have a standard of living above what we earn. But today in Chile, the Chileans owe 10% of their GNP in interest payments to the rest of the world forever. All the product out of one out of every 10 Chileans has to be taken away from Chile and given to their bankers elsewhere in the world. If we borrow $6,000 billion, we'll be very deep in the black hole and find it very hard to dig ourselves out, just like Chile is finding it very hard to dig itself out. Scenario number three. Scenario number three is you've got to remember that the dollar is de facto the world's reserve currency. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that there are hundreds of billions of dollars held by people that never plan to come to the United States, have no interest in investing in the United States. They hold their money in dollars for safety reasons. It's the equivalent of money in the mattress. That's a very nervous crowd. That crowd could bail out tomorrow morning. The world's reserve currency has never, in all of human history, been held by a net debtor nation. Who would put their money in the mattress of a guy who's broke? He would have a temptation to take your money. Yet that's what, what the world is doing at the moment. They're doing something they have never done before. Being willing to treat as a reserve currency the currency of a country that, in fact, is the world's largest net debtor nation. Now, which of those scenarios is true? They'll bail out tomorrow morning, the window will slam three years from now, or the window will slam 30 years from now. I don't know. You don't know? Nobody knows. But we do know what happens when it slams. And that is the value of the American currency has got to go down to the point where foreign products are so expensive that we balance our balance of payments because we just can't afford to buy imports. Now, the economists of the world are now making estimates as to how low that would have to be. I'm on the public record of arguing that if you look at the value of the yen to the dollar, it will have to be something less than 100 yen to the dollar. At the moment, it's 150 yen to the dollar, and there's a long ways to go. But the key thing to understand about a falling currency is a falling currency is the equivalent of a national giveback. It's exactly like every American went to his employer and said, you're now paying me $10 an hour. I'd agree to work for $7 an hour. Because from the point of view of a German, when if the wage was $10 an hour, back when it was three marks to the dollar, Americans got paid 30 marks an hour. Now that it's two marks to the dollar, Americans get paid 20 marks an hour, and the American wage has fallen by a third. And of course, in terms of buying German products, the American wage has fallen by a third, because German products are 30% more expensive than they used to be if you go over and take that German vacation or whatever that you might have done in the past. And so we can compete with a falling currency. See, Bangladesh, in the technical sense, is competitive. Bangladesh balances its balance payments every year. It does so by people working for 50 cents a day. Any country can become competitive by lowering its wage rate. It's a trivial thing to do. It's easy to do. It only has that nasty side effect. It's one of the ways you lower your standard of living. 
And so if Americans are forced to lower their standard of living, we will become competitive, no question of that. Now what the average person, however, means by being competitive is not how do I become competitive lowering my standard of living. What they mean is how can I be competitive in world markets and still have my current wage rate? And that's a much tougher problem. And see, this is where the Japanese and the rest of the world impact us. Because something's happened out there in the world. Nobody can produce a high quality product out of low quality components. Nobody can build a high quality <laughs> economy out of low quality inputs. If you want to compete with the Japanese in the world market at a high income level, all of the inputs going into the American economy, and there are four principal inputs, the quality of the workforce, the amount of capital equipment they work with, the level of technology they work with, and the quality of the management that they get, unless all four of those things are at world-class level, i.e. Japanese levels, you can't compete with the Japanese or the rest of the world. And so we have a problem which, from the point of view of economics, is crystal clear and very simple. But from the point of view of politics, it's very murky. Because the problem is, on the 4th of July, we like to talk about competition. But competition has two big downsides. The first downside is you can be beaten. I noticed the University of The University of Kansas doesn't win too often in Big A football. They do better in basketball, but not terribly good in football. To say that you play Nebraska every year is not to say you win half the time. To say that you play Japan every year is not to say you win economically half the time. The second downside of competition is competition may force you to change standard, revered, well-loved, time-tested American operating procedures. Now, the people who played single wing football when they invented the T formation in the past probably thought the other side was cheating. What it meant was you could no longer ever again play single wing football. And see, in this case, the change is even more fundamental. We play football, the rest of the world plays soccer. We're not terribly good at playing soccer, but the world game is not football, it's soccer. And so when you join the world economy, you're going to play soccer or you're not going to compete. That's the only genuine World Cup out there in the world. And what's happened is we are now in a world economy with lots of other countries that are export-oriented, used to playing the world economy game, and for the first time we have to play. And it's a game we're not terribly good at, and it's a game that's going to require us to do different things. Instead of putting on a lot of pads and throwing the football, you're going to have to learn to kick things with your feet and do things that Americans are not terribly good at doing. Now, let's take a brief tour through all the fundamental inputs going into the American economy, look at how they compare with the rest of the world in general, with Japan in particular, and then say to ourselves, what are we going to do? How are we going to bring that input up to Japanese levels? And as I shall illustrate, economically, that's usually not difficult, but politically it's very difficult. Let's start out <laughs> with the most fundamental input that goes into anybody's economy. That's the quality of its workforce. If you compare the quality of the Japanese workforce with the quality of the American workforce, where do you show up? Well, let's look at some of the numbers. You notice right before Thanksgiving, the Census Bureau announced that 13% of the American workforce is functionally illiterate. That means you can't read and write at the fifth grade level. What fraction of the Japanese workforce do you think is functionally illiterate? One half of one percent. Which means there are 26 times as many illiterates in the United States as there are in Japan. <coughs> How do you plan to compete as an American employer with 26 times as many illiterates on your payroll? If you give math exams to high school seniors, the average Japanese student scores twice as well on a math exam as an American high school senior. How do you plan to compete in a computerized, mathematized world knowing half as much mathematics? 
if you look at colleges, 40% of all the Japanese college graduates graduated in engineering and science. 8% of all the American college graduates graduated in engineering and science. Kind of stands to reason that maybe Japanese products will be a little bit better engineered. They have five times as many engineers going into the system as we have going into the system. Now, if you think about all of those things, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out how you upgrade American education to make it competitive. It takes a genius to make us do it. For example, suppose you were to look at those functional literacy rates in high school <coughs> achievement scores. My kid goes to school 180 days a year. A Japanese kid goes to school 240 days a year. It's a form of American chutzpah to think that my kid can learn in 180 days what a Japanese kid takes 240 days to learn. And my kid goes to school six hours a day. The Japanese kid goes to school seven hours a day. And if you're a middle class family, you send your kid to another hour and a half of after school school to prep for the national exams. And so by the time a Japanese child has graduated from high school, that person will have twice as many classroom hours under their belt as an American child will when they graduate from an American high school. Now, it doesn't take a genius to know we'll have to go to school longer. The shortest school year in continental Europe is 220 days. Nobody except the Canadians goes to school as little as 180 days. Even underdeveloped countries go a lot longer than that. Now, I live in one of those New England towns that has a town meeting. We have no city manager, no mayor, no city council. We do it all to ourselves. We can't blame anybody for anything. It's terrible. <laughs> we have a town meeting the last Saturday of March, a month and a half from now. What do you think would happen to me if I stood up in that town meeting and said, boys and girls, the 180-day school year's over? Do you think they'd whip out the palm branches? My God, how would McDonald's work? We'd have to pay more taxes. My vacation. My whole life would be disrupted. But of course, one of the morals of stories with competition is competition makes you do things you don't want to do. You simply have to do them if you want to be competitive. And it isn't, of course, just the Japanese. You know, the Koreans think the Japanese are a little lazy. <laughs> If you're a senior in high school in Korea, your mama packs you two lunches. Because you go to school at 8 o'clock in the morning and you come home at 10 o'clock at night. Because at the end of your senior year, you're going to take a competitive exam. And if you aren't in the top 30% of that exam, you are never going to go to college. And see, in the modern world, if the labor force in Manhattan, Kansas, isn't as good as the labor force in Korea, the plant would be in Korea. And you don't compete with Topeka, you compete with Seoul, Tokyo, Stockholm, Frankfurt, Paris, Rome. That's what the real competition is. And your quality of your workforce and my workforce has to be as good as the workforce <laughs> in those parts of the world. Let's take savings and investment. If you, in 1985, if you went to Japan and found it, there were 67,300 programmable robots in Japanese industry. There were 117 million people in Japan. If you came to the United States and counted, there were 14,500 programmable robots in the United States. And so on a per capita basis, there were 10 times as many robots in Japan as there were in Japan, I mean in the United States. Now, how do you plan to compete? See, I, I have what I call Thoreau's axiom number one. MIT people like things like that, the road to axiom number one. <laughs> axiom number one is a Japanese worker with a robot most of the time is better than an American worker without a robot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very important when you say that. <laughs> Who do the Japanese get ten times as many robots? Well, there's a complicated part of that story and a simple part of that story. The simple part of that story is in 1986, the great American family saved 3.9% of its income. The Japanese family saved 21% of its income. And so in some real sense, the American worker was deciding to buy a recreational vehicle with his income. The Japanese worker was deciding to buy a robot with his income. But because the Japanese worker bought a robot, you don't have a job and can't afford to buy gas to run your recreational vehicle. 
And if you say to an economist, how do you raise the American savings rate? And I should say the Japanese are not the world's highest savers. That's the Italians. The Italians save 24% of their income, more than the Japanese. Many countries in Europe save 20% of their income. The country that is peculiar is the United States saving 3.9. You know what the next worst industrial country does and is? It's Canada, and it saves 13% of its income. That's the lowest other country in the industrial world. Everybody's above 13. Only the United States is below 13, and we're one hell of a long ways below 13. Now let me do what the Germans call a Gedanken experiment. I'm going to tell you how to save a much higher fraction of your income or put you in a world where you will save a much higher fraction of your income. I'm going to put your own personal savings rate in your mind. What fraction of your income did your family save last year? And if your answer to that question is zero, don't be terribly embarrassed because for about 40% of all Americans, the number is zero. But now let me march into your life, and I'm going to do a set of things to you. These are all done in the rest of the world. None of them are hypotheticals. First thing I'm going to do is treat you like a German, and I will abolish all tax deductibility of mortgage interest. First home, second home, every home. Can't deduct mortgage interest payments from your taxes. That means it costs twice as much money to borrow money. You borrow less, have a smaller house, spend less on housing. I'm going to treat you as a West German, and I will abolish all tax deductibility of consumer income. Refrigerator, recreational vehicle, no tax deductibility of consumer income. I will treat you like a Japanese, and in Japan, to buy a house, you must have a 40% cash down payment. None of this is 0, 10, 20% business. 40%, no house. That means you buy a house later, have to get a big nest egg together to buy that house, and industry can use that big nest egg to buy robots until you get enough together to buy your house. I'm going to treat you like an Austrian, and I will have a value added tax. Most of the world has a value added tax, that's a tax on consumption. In Austria, it's 15% on necessities, 30% on luxuries, and cars are classified as luxuries. Want to buy a $10,000 car? Send $3,000 to the Austrian government. Don't buy the car. Don't send the $3,000. That's a rather large sign that says you should be very careful in buying new cars. I'm going to treat you like a Norwegian on cars, and in Norway, you must have an 80% cash down payment to buy a car. You can borrow 20%, but it's got to be paid back in 12 months. None of this 60-month no-down-payment car loans in Norway. Finally, I'm going to treat you like a Japanese, and I'm going to march into the life of every family in this room, and I will take one-third of your income away from you, and I will give it back to you as a bonus once every six months. Now, I know you'll save it for six months, because I won't give it to you. And the chances are, if it comes as a big lump sum rather than a weekly or a monthly wage, you'll save more of it than it came as that weekly or monthly wage, because that's precisely what both Japanese and Americans do. Now, suppose I did all of those things to you, not one of your neighbors, but to you. How much do you think your savings rate would go up? Well, I can't guarantee it would go up to 21%, but I can guarantee it would go up. That's how the rest of the world did it. They didn't do it with ancient samurai frugality. As far as I know, there is no ancient samurai frugality in Italy. <laughs> they did it by building a world where you can't have what you want unless you save the money ahead of time. We in America have built precisely the opposite world, where you can have everything you want and never have to save ahead of time. But the problem with our world is we end up with a very low savings rate. The rest of the world has a very high savings rate, and that means we don't have as much capital equipment as the rest of the world has. Let's think about research and development. Third factor going into the economy. We in the United States at the moment are putting 1.5% of the GNP into civilian research and development. The Japanese, the Germans, and the French are all putting 1.5% of the GNP into civilian research and development. I mean, 2.5%. Thoreau's axiom number two. The German engineer with money most of the time is better than an American engineer without money. How do you plan to compete spending less money on research and development than the rest of the world? Of course, the answer is you won't. That spending will have to be brought up to world-class levels. Now, when you add in military spending, then we spend about as much as the rest of the world. But the rest of the world doesn't spend any significant amount of military research and development. And we spend a very substantial amount, which means that if we want to be competitive, we've got to spend more on research and development than the rest of the world to make sure that we're spending a competitive amount on civilian products. 
And everywhere in the world, governments pays directly or indirectly a very large fraction of research and development spend. That means somebody in the United States is going to have to pay some taxes to up research and development. Nobody in the United States wants to do that. Let's take management. Are American managers competitive in the world? Is American management as good as that in the rest of the world? Well, let me give you one brief illustration. We talked about this afternoon in the seminar. In 1982, Ford and Toyota made exactly the same number of cars. The number of managers and white collar overhead people at Ford, however, was 10 times as large as that of Toyota. A rather vivid example of non-competitive management. The president of Toyota makes $775,000 a year. The president of Ford makes $8 million a year. Do you think he's 10 times the manager? I suspect not in that kind of an operation. You know, if you were making a movie about this set of events, you know, the old-fashioned Western where you put a black hat on the bad guys and a white hat on the good guys, an economic movie would have every American with a black hat in terms of all these fundamental influences. For example, I do a lot of testifying to congressional committees. What do you think would have happened to me if I had taken all those things on upping the saving rate, and the next time I testified to the Joint Economic Committee, I suggested all those things? think they would have listened? Everybody would have said, hey, we know the United States needs more savings and investment, but don't hurt me. But of course, if you take an economics course, you know more savings is a code word for less consumption. There is no way to save more without somebody consuming less. And nobody consumes less voluntarily. You have to be put in a world where you have no choice but to consume less, because the purpose of an economy, obviously, is consumption in some long-run sense. And so what it is is the equivalent of the United States going to the fat farm. And if you think about a fat farm, it's very peculiar. You pay somebody to starve you, when you could just lock your refrigerator and not eat and not have to pay anybody to starve you. But see, we in the United States have precisely that problem. For a long period of time, we had it easy, and in some sense, we got fat. So now, in a world where we have to be lean and mean, as they like to say, and it is very hard to go from being fat to being lean and mean. Now, the Japanese have a problem. Let's, think, let's put on our Japanese hats and imagine that everybody in this room is a Japanese. What's the problem from the Japanese point of view? Their problem is just as severe as our problem. The Japanese problem is that after World War II, they built an export-oriented economy. It is an economy that cannot run without rising exports. It's got whole industries that can only export. If you're a very poor, relatively small, underdeveloped economy in 1953, this export model is perfectly appropriate. But when you become the world's second largest industrial economy by 1986, it is not perfectly appropriate because the problem is your export surpluses have to become so large that the rest of the world cannot absorb those export surpluses. But the Japanese have an economy where every year they've got to have a bigger export surplus in order to keep the whole thing rolling. Yet they know that in some long run sense, they can't do that. Now, there have been two white papers in Japan written by wise men groups. First was under Prime Minister Tanaka, who was the Prime Minister who was discredited in the uh, Lockheed scandal, and the most recent, uh, about a year ago, under Prime Minister Nakasone. Just like we can very easily see what we should do, but find it very hard to do, the Japanese know precisely what they should do and find it impossible to do. What they have to do is take their economy and rebuild it from an export-led economy into a domestic-led economy. And it has to be domestic demand for goods and services that carries the Japanese economy in the future as opposed to export demand for goods and services that carries the Japanese economy. What both of these papers have suggested, and they're right, the same thing, what they've noticed is that Japan has a huge deficit in what you could call infrastructure. Japan has fewer people per square mile than Holland, but they have houses that are very small by Dutch standards. Average Japanese home is an underdeveloped home as opposed to a home of a rich person living in a rich industrial society. 
And so the Japanese need to put a tremendous amount of money into housing. But there's some very difficult problems. What industries in Japan have political clout? The big exporters like Fujitsu, Hitachi, those kind of people. There is no residential construction industry. It has no political clout at all. In the United States, our residential construction industry is the, probably the most powerful lobbyist in America. But in Japan, it doesn't exist. And so they find it very hard because if you're sitting there in Fujitsu, the idea of exporting less and fewer electronics and building more houses doesn't seem axiomatically the correct thing to do. And so they have tremendous resistance. And they also have some problems inside the country that make it very hard to do it. For example, Japan has no concept of eminent domain. You can't go in and just take property and use it for things like roads, houses, that kind of stuff and they find it very hard to buy large hunks of property. Because if you look at especially the Tokyo area, you can't give people large homes in terms of single family homes, but you could give them high rise apartments where everybody had a large apartment. But to do that, you've got to get major blocks of land together and without eminent domain, without the kind of techniques we use in the United States, it's very difficult to do. Now you can say to the Japanese, change your laws, but they don't find it any easier to change their laws and invent eminent domain than we do in the United States to change our laws about consumer credit. The Japanese also have a shade law. The shade law that says that if anybody builds a building and puts your home in their shade at any time during the year, they have to negotiate with you, sign a contract, and pay you. How many high rises do you think would be built in Kansas City with that law? Precisely zero. And that shade law makes it very difficult to build those kind of high-rise buildings in Japan. Now, once again, you could say, hey, change your shade laws. But they don't find it easier to change their laws than we find it easy to change our laws and our customs. Only about a third of all the homes in Japan are connected to public sewage. They could put a lot of pipes in the ground building sewer lines around the Japanese economy. Japan has 117 million people. We have 240. We buy 16 million cars and light trucks. The Japanese buy three and a half. Why don't the Japanese buy any cars? They never built any roads. A car without a road doesn't do you much good. Now that wasn't an accident. It was a deliberate national strategy after World War II to hold down car consumption by not building roads. That's a perfectly valid strategy in the 1950s. By the time you become wealthy in the 1980s, it's not a perfectly valid strategy. But here again, how do you build roads without eminent domain? The Japanese found it very hard to build Narita Airport. Uh, and one of the reasons they still have problems is because of this very cumbersome procedure that you have for doing those kind of public things inside the United States. And so the Japanese, in some very real sense, know they're going to blow up the world economy. They, if they continue to do what they're now doing, the world economy blows up because the world just can't absorb those kind of exports. But they, they find it impossible to change. We know that if we don't do something to rebuild our economy, we also blow up our future standard of living. But we also find it impossible to change. Now, both of us have these problems at home, and then we have some collective problems we have to solve jointly because we do, in fact, live in the same world economy, which means we have to agree on what the set of rules are and how we operate. And we find that very difficult to do on both sides. The other day, I was on a program with the Japanese ambassador, and he said it right. What he said was, the last time we wrote the rules of international trade in any fundamental sense was when we had the initial GATT agreement, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, in the 1953. He said, you know, at that time, you wrote all the rules. You were occupying Germany and Japan. Everybody else needed Marshall Plan money. And if you said, I want rule X, that was precisely what we put into the international rules. He said, the difference is, in 1986, you can't write all the rules. The Europeans are going to write 25% of, of the rules. We Japanese are going to write 25% of the rules. And maybe you Americans will be allowed to write 50% of the rules but half the time you'll have to play by our rules and do things that you haven't traditionally done. Americans don't like to play by foreign rules, but in the new world economy, we're going to have to play by foreign rules at least half the time. And that means, for example, foreign countries all have nationalized industries. 
those nationalized industries aren't going to disappear. American companies are going to have to compete with those nationalized industries. And the question is, what kind of rules do we have for nationalized industries competing with private companies? The rest of the world has industrial policies, which is a little bit like having a coach and a strategy. Suppose Kansas State was playing the University of Kansas, and Kansas State decided, we're going to be real free enterprises, and we'll do it without a coach and without a strategy. How often do you think Kansas State would win? Precisely zero. But of course, that's what we're playing at the moment. The rest of the world says, we're going to have a coach and we're going to have a strategy. And the American response is, we can play this ball game without a coach and without a strategy. Well, if we were winning the ball game, maybe that would be true. But given that we're losing the ball game, it's very hard to argue that that's true. Yet the rest of the world is not going to give up their coach and their strategy. Miti exists. The Japanese have a strategy. And one way or another, we Americans are going to have to cope with that strategy, either with our own strategy or finding some offsetting thing that is so good that we can compete without that kind of a strategic thinking in some of long-run sense. Now, the other thing that we do jointly, and of course this is eminently part of human nature, what can every human being do? Every human being is very good at seeing what their neighbor ought to do to improve. Very hard to see what yourself ought to do to improve. We go to the Japanese, and we say to the Japanese, you ought to expand your economy with easier monetary or fiscal policy. If you would do that, you would make the world economy bigger, we could export more to Japan, and we would come closer to solving our balance of payments problems without having to have this tremendous change in currency values. And when we say that to the Japanese, we are 100% right, and the Japanese say no. Japanese diagnose the problem differently. They say, you Americans are being profligate, you're borrowing too much money, you have this huge federal deficit, your consumers are in record debt, and your corporations are in record debt, all levels of the American society should borrow less. And if you borrowed less, you would need less of the world's savings, and therefore we could more easily solve these problems in the world with a smaller fall in the value of the dollar, a smaller rise in the value of the yen. And when the Japanese tell us that, they are absolutely 100% right. And we say, no. Neither one of us wants to do those things that both of us know that if we did them, the world economy would work better between ourselves. Now, we have a problem. The problem is we live in the same world. And it's complicated in another way. But people often say, well, aren't the Japanese in some sense cheating because they take a free ride in our Defense Department? The answer to that is, that's not a question with a simple answer. And let me try and illustrate that. Suppose I had a button right here on this table. And if I press that button, instead of putting 1% of their GNP in the defense, starting tomorrow morning, the Japanese would put 7 to 8% of their GNP in the defense, which is what we do. Would you want me to press the button? With 1% of the GNP in defense, the Japanese have the fifth largest army in the world. With 7% of their GNP in defense, they would have the second largest army in the world. The United States would have the third. And at Reykjavik, there wouldn't be two powers, there would be three. Three superpowers in the world. And on many issues, the Japanese wouldn't be on our side like Middle Eastern conflict. The Japanese have no interest in Israel, no guilt about Israel, and a lot of interest in Arab oil. In the Middle East, it would be Japan, Russia, and the Arabs versus the United States, Israel, or whomever. And what, it, what that fact of life does is it makes America schizophrenic in its dealing with the Japanese. Because you'll get the American trade negotiator who gets on a plane in Washington and he's giving a press conference. And he says, I'm going to go to Japan and I'm going to knock heads. And when he get on our way to Japan, he gets a phone call from Mr. Schultz and Mr. Weinberger. He gets off the plane in Japan and he says, I'm here to be reasonable. Because we in the United States are trying to do something today that no country has ever done, I think, in human history. Think about great superpower rivalries in the past. Why did Rome hate Carthage, Spain hate Portugal, Germany hate England? The answer is that they were rivals for the same gold mines, the same colonies, the things they thought made you rich. But the 
peculiar self thing about us in the Soviet Union is we have no economic conflicts whatsoever. If anything, they're a good customer for some of our products. All of our economic rivalries are with our military allies. And you can't simply declare war on your military allies, economic war on your military allies, and still have military allies. And so it makes this whole arrangement a very complicated thing. Uh, and if you think about the rest of the world, how much do you think China wants to see Japan putting 7% of its GNP in the defense? Does Korea want to see that? Not very many people in the world want to see that because there's a certain historical ring uh, to that kind of a problem. And so what you get is a very complicated relationship between Japan and the United States where we all tend to say things without saying things. Uh, nobody stands up and says Japan should not become a military superpower. Uh, we say, hey, maybe Japan should carry a little bit more of the military load, but we don't really want them to carry a, a lot more of the military load. And so there are all these terribly complicated mixed messages. Now I think if you think about the relationships of China, between Japan and the United States, one final comment. The important thing to understand about Japan is it's the first non-Western nation to be a genuinely first-class industrial country. And there is a difference. The Japanese are not little Americans. They do things differently. Uh, they may not do them better, sometimes they do them worse, but they do them differently. And what it means is that we bring the first non-Western nation into first-class industrial status, or as they push their way in, which is probably a more accurate way to describe it, there are fundamental things in Western society that are going to have to change, because they're going to do things that we have to respond to and make us react in very different ways. Now, the challenge we Americans face Suppose you went to Las Vegas, and on the Las Vegas tote board, it, instead of having sports bets or roulette bets, they had economic bets. And you, the bet was the following. Suppose we came back in the year 2020. Today, the United States and Japan have almost equal per capita GNP. We're coming back 35 years from now. Would you, and let's assume that everybody in this room has to bet $10,000, a non-trivial sum. And the bet is, in 2020, will the United States have a per capita GNP equal to or inferior to that of Japan? Which way would you bet? Would you put $10,000 on, will have an equal GNP? Or will you put $10,000, the Japanese will be substantially ahead of us by the year 2020? Now that's the, that's the problem we face. And it isn't something you could forecast because it depends on what you do, but we do. Uh, the Japanese bet would be, are we going to be able to change our economy to make it the world's second largest industrial economy and a domestic economy, or will we find it impossible to make that kind of change and eventually blow up our own prosperity and some of the prosperity of the rest of the world? We both face very
and it, it's something where working out these American-Japanese differences is terribly important, just not to Americans and Japanese, but terribly important to the rest of the world. You know, about the rapidly developing economies on the Pacific Rim and them being kind of an outlet for the Japanese activities. The, the real problem with those economies, you know, sometimes Japan is referred to as the big tiger, and Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea are the four little, little tigers. The problem with the little tigers is they're very small in terms of population. Uh, and you're talking about Korea is the biggest with about 40 million people. Taiwan has half that amount, and Hong Kong and Singapore are basically city states. Well, see, if you think about the other countries on the Pacific Rim, they're still at it. Now, if you think about Korea, it took it 30, 40 years to kind of get to the point where it had kind of rust out takeoff. If you look at Indonesia, Thailand, those places, I think they're still a decade or two away from the kind of rapid economic growth we see in Taiwan and Korea. And so it doesn't, I don't think, really provide the kind of outlet the Japanese thinks. There's no way Indonesia can buy 14 million video recorders tomorrow morning. And that's what Japan sells in the United States. Uh, the Japanese are really hooked on the American market, just like we're really hooked on Japanese loans. Both of us need each other, but we're on a track where we can't continue. We're going to need each other in the long run, but it's going to have to be on a very different track than we are at the moment. Now, see, what you're talking about is what the Japanese used to call their co-prosperity sphere. And that co-prosperity sphere idea is precisely why having the Japanese put 7% into the military is not something that's terribly attractive if you're sitting in the Philippines, Indonesia, any of those countries. What about the Japanese both and Americans both thinking about getting bigger market share? See, it's a little bit like Kansas playing Kansas State in basketball. Your rivals, but you've got to agree on a common set of rules of hiring a common set of referees. And if you can't be rivals without the Greek also being cooperative. And so the question is, how are you simultaneously both rivals and cooperative? There are rivals for markets, which have to be cooperative in terms of keeping the league going. Well, precisely the same thing is true in the world economy. We talk about Japan and the United States being competitive, and that's true. We also talk about Japan and the United States having to be cooperative, and that's true. And the question is, how do you do both simultaneously? Uh, because both are important, and you can't make one work without the other. If you can't be cooperative, you can't play a competitive game. Uh, and, and it's almost that simple, and so it's a more complicated problem than simply saying, let's forget being competitive and be cooperative. The answer is you have to do both simultaneously. And you both have to realize that your standard of living partly depends on the other guy. The American standard of living would not be as high as it is without Japan. The Japanese standard of living would be not be as high as it is without the United States. And so we're, we're both, in that sense, double hooked. The question is, what, a, what about the money supply of Mr. Volker? Uh, see, Mr. Volker has an obsolete job. He thinks he's important and he no longer is. <laughs> See, because there isn't an American money supply. There's a world money supply, which is some combination of dollars, mark, yen, French francs, all those other world currencies. And it's like having six people flying the airplane. Each one thinks he's flying his airplane, but the fact is that they're all in control simultaneously of the same airplane, and they have some impact on where that airplane goes, but they don't control it in the old-fashioned sense. Uh, and uh, one of the things we're, we talk about that we haven't yet done is it's clear that if we go down the current road and go to the kind of world economy we seem to be building, at some point we're going to have to coordinate monetary policy. There isn't going to be such a thing as an independent American money supply because there is no such thing. You and I can do deals with the United States and German marks. We don't need dollars. You and I can buy, borrow euro dollars that are completely out from under the jurisdiction of Mr. Volcker. Uh, you and I can do deals in Yen. We can both do a deal in the Bahamas without ever being there. All of those ways are the ways to escape what Mr. Volcker is doing. And so what it basically means, when you look at those weekly money supply numbers that come out every Thursday night, you shouldn't look at them. They're a heck of a lot less important than they were 10 years ago. Yeah, because what about the window slamming shut in international lending? And the people who slam it shut are not going to be the Japanese, they're going to be the Europeans. See, right before Christmas, the Ministry of Finance in Japan basically issued a set of regulations which said to Japanese financial institutions, you are going to lend money to the Americans even though you lose money lending money to Americans.
because we have decided as a nation that losing money on these financial assets is less important than losing export markets. And if you don't lend money to Americans, the yen will go way up and we'll lose our export markets. And so the Japanese are not going to slam the window. The people who slam the window are going to be the Europeans. Because in Europe, they don't have that kind of a tightly coordinated response. And if you're thinking, you're sitting there as a Swiss, suppose you invested money in the United States in March 1985. You've lost 60% of your money since then. Because the Swiss franc has gone down or up 60% vis-a-vis the dollar since then. So a major in terms of Swiss francs, you're 60% poorer than you were when you put your money in the United States. And at some point, as a Swiss, even though Swiss are known for being stubborn and slightly stupid, they will quit. Because <laughs> uh, nobody's going to do that forever. Now, nobody knows when, as I said before, but it's the Europeans that are apt to run from the dollar as opposed to the Japanese. Because the Japanese know they're dependent on the American market. And if they run for the dollar, they're destroying their own markets. Uh, the Europeans would also be doing the same thing, but in Europe and many countries, and some of those countries are not dependent on the American market. And there will be a lot higher probability of the Europeans slamming the door than there ever will be of the Japanese slamming the door. You mentioned this theory of the Japanese educational system. What do you think about the proposed system whereby Reagan's Secretary of Education's proposed system whereby student loans would be uh, paid back not on the basis of people planning their careers around payments, but payments based on their payment in the career, regardless of whether it's a low-paying career, which is in the arts. You mean paying a percentage of their income back Correct. as opposed to just As opposed to people planning high-paying careers planning a career they enjoy. The question is, what about kind of changing the student loan system where instead of paying back a certain amount of money plus interest, you basically pay back a fraction of your income? That's something that's been suggested periodically by lots of people. It has, it has the simple problem that annuities have. Who would take the deal and who wouldn't take the deal? If you plan to go into investment banking, you wouldn't take the deal. If you plan to go into high school teaching, you would take the deal. And therefore, the American government will lose a fantastic amount of money. Because only those people who think they're going to have low incomes would sign up for the deal. Uh, and in that kind of a thing, you either have to make it compulsory for everybody, or else you can't really run as an insurance center. And since you're not going to make it compulsory, that kind of self-selection problem has killed every proposal like that that has ever occurred in the past. And this is one of those places where the Secretary of Education just hasn't done his history. If he'd done his history, he would have known that that's not a new idea and it doesn't work because of self-selection. And also, yeah. don't the Japanese also have a highly percentage-wise technical education? Well, that's what I mean. American art? See, that's what I mentioned, that, that if you take all of our major competitors, they all graduate about 40% of their college graduates in engineering and science. And so there's no question the rest of the world is turning out a more technologically oriented college edu group, educated group than we are in the United States. Uh, now, it's not to say that we have to go to 40%. But it is to say that 80% is probably too low if you think about what the American economy needs. And it's especially true given that we want to have a defense department because the estimate is that 40% of all the engineers in America work on defense products in the United States. So if we're taking 40% out for defense and we only have 8% to begin with, then you're talking about a very small cadre of American engineers having to compete with a very large cadre of Japanese engineers. But the question is, are per capita expenditure on education very high? And of course, that's true. Not uh, but you can, you can spend a lot of money on law school, just like you can spend a lot of money on engineering schools. Yeah. Do you ever see agriculture coming to a point where it can be effective and probably fail? And if so, what needs to be done? Well, it's going to wear agriculture. surpluses are over for the foreseeable future for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Green Revolution has worked. Last year, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, China, they all fed themselves. The only places that don't feed themselves are the Soviet Union and Africa south of the Sahara. In Africa south of the Sahara, you can give them things, but you can't sell it to them, and therefore isn't an export. Uh, now, the Green Revolution is a disaster if you're a Canada's wheat farmer. <laughs> greatest thing in the world if you live in Pakistan, because it means you can feed people and you don't have to have a lot of hungry people. And, but it means the market for wheat in 
world markets is a lot smaller than it was not too long ago. <coughs> the second thing that happens even more dramatic, if you take the common market, Europe, in the mid-1970s, they imported 25 million metric tons of grain. Last year, they exported 16 million metric tons of grain. That's a 41 million metric ton swing. Uh, we think of American agriculture being the best in the world. And we're about seven years out of date. Because in the last 10 years, productivity in foreign agriculture has been rising faster than productivity in American agriculture. And that productivity <coughs> gap between American agriculture and foreign agriculture has either diminished or in some cases disappeared. For example, if we had free trade between the United States and Europe and agricultural products at the moment, most of the studies show, yes, we would show, sell a little bit more grain in Europe. But the Dutch and Danish dairy farmers would drive American dairy farmers out of business. They get more milk per cow, more milk per acre, and the cheese tastes better. What more do you have to do? Uh, Kansas may think free trade with the common market's a good thing. I can guarantee you that Wisconsin and Vermont would think that free trade with the common market was a bad thing. And you can't have it both ways. You're either going to have more open agriculture for everything or not open for everything. You can't just open it up for wheat. And you take that agriculture in Europe that's developed very rapidly, and you take the green revolution, and it means the big market for agricultural products just isn't there. And what happens if you give a Kansas farmer a lot of money? He plows it back into technology and new, and new equipment. What happens if you give a Spanish farmer a lot of money? Precisely the same thing. I was in southern Spain during the wheat harvest in June and July, and you will see combines in southern Spain that you will see very few of in Kansas. Because in the last five years, Spanish farmers have had a lot of money to buy equipment. American farmers have not had a lot of money to buy equipment. And therefore, there's more of the new stuff in Europe than there is in the United States. Well, that's a world that just didn't used to exist. And what it means is that American agriculture is now on a very different footing relative to those export markets than it was just even a decade ago. It's important to understand that. Uh, you know, the world changes on those kind of dimensions. And catching up with the United States in terms of productivity is not just something that happens in industry. It also happens in agriculture. If the Japanese opened up their market for rice, it wouldn't be the United States that would benefit. It would be Thailand, which is the world's low-cost producer of rice. Yep. What about the federal budget? Isn't that a significant part of the deterioration of the last six years of international trade division? Yeah, as I mentioned in my talk, when the Japanese tell us to balance our budget, they're absolutely right. Uh, the problem with our balancing our budget, of course, is it leads to something that is unacceptable to the President of the United States called the tax increase. If you take a $200 billion deficit, there is no way to eliminate a $200 billion deficit without a large tax increase. If you take defense, Social Security, and interest on the national debt, that is 85% of total spending. We're talking about $200 billion, which is 20% of the budget. The only place you can get 20% of the budget is out of those three things. And since it's illegal to cut interest on the national debt, you're left with defense and social security. And there isn't any public willingness to cut either one of those. The other day, I got a public opinion poll that was done by NBC New York Times. The first question was, do you want to balance the federal budget? About 80% of the population said yes. Second question was, do you want to raise taxes? About 80% of the population said no. <laughs> then they had 15 questions. Do you want to cut Social Security? Do you want to cut defense? 15 different things you could cut. There wasn't a majority for cutting any of them. They didn't even want to cut foreign aid, which is a trivially small expenditure. You can't get anything like $200 billion out of foreign aid since you only spend seven. Uh, but there wasn't a majority out there to cut anything. And so when you say, hey, Washington isn't doing its job, I think Washington in a democratic sense is doing its job, democratic with a small d. Washington isn't solving the problem because we don't want to solve the problem. Because we aren't willing to do any of the things, which is either raise taxes or cut spending, that you would have to do. And if you think seriously about the spending side, maybe, maybe you could find $50 billion worth of spending cuts you would be willing to make. That still leaves you with $150 billion worth of tax increase. And we're not going to deal. See, we won't deal with the federal budget deficit until the rest of the world quits lending. When the rest of the world quits lending, we will have to deal with the federal budget deficit. But until that time, we don't have to. Uh, nothing bad's happening. So you think about what Marty Feldstein told President Reagan four or five years ago. What do you say? 
you run $200 billion deficit, you have inflation, crowding out, which means less investment in planned equipment, uh, higher interest rates, and a whole set of bad things. How many of those things have happened? Zero. Why, if you were President Reagan, would you possibly believe any economist who tells you bad things will happen? <laughs> you just had one of the country's most prominent economists who tells you a disaster, you go ahead and do it anyway, and no disaster. Now, we know the reason why. The reason why is we have a $200 billion federal budget deficit that the foreigners lend us $200 billion every year, and so you and I don't have to pay for the deficit, essentially. And as long as they're willing to lend us the $200 billion every year, the deficit won't have any bad effects. It's when they don't lend us the money that the bad effects start to become immediately obvious. You do have the crowding out, you do have the falling dollar, you do have the inflationary pressures and all those kind of things. But the question is, will we as a democracy act to prevent that problem? Or will we wait for the crisis and then deal with the federal budget deficit? Right back, the point that is made is that we import 40% of our energy and we can't afford to buy it. That's absolutely true. If you were being an economist, and maybe if you were being a congressman and could vote secretly, <laughs> everybody on Capitol Hill knows how to solve the federal budget deficit problem and help solve the energy problem and the oil import problem. And that is you have a very big gasoline tax. The rest of the world, the industrial world, the average gasoline tax is $1.50 a gallon. Italy, it's two dollars and fifty cents a gallon. Gasoline, when you add in the price of the gasoline, now comes at somewhere between three and four dollars a gallon. Why does the rest of the world have a dollar and a half tax on gasoline? Because they import the gasoline and can't afford to pay for it. The United States is now in that position. A penny on a gasoline tax raises a billion dollars. Fifty cents raises fifty billion dollars. Dollar raises a hundred billion dollars. If you were really serious about the federal government deficit problem, if you're serious about the import problem, you would have a gasoline tax. Of all the ways to raise money, they're all painful. That is the least painful of all. But we find it impossible to do as yet. But when we come to solving the problem, and of course the rest of the world looks at us and they say, my God, we've got a 12 cent gasoline tax or 16 cent gasoline tax. What the hell's going on? You've got an easy way to solve this problem. And of course, from their perspective, it does look easy because a dollar tax would look minimal compared to Italy. Uh, and so if you think about the deficit problem, you'll go to gasoline. <laughs> One final question. There's somebody back here, yeah. See, I don't think it's impossible. 
I'm an optimist in that sense. I think you can, in fact, take some things that seem politically impossible, and if you do them in the right context, in the right way, at the right time, you can make them into things that are, in fact, sellable. See, I'm old enough to be of the Sputnik generation. I was in college when Sputnik went up. In the post-Sputnik, Sputnik, you know, when it comes to human history, was trivial. The Russians put up a round ball one and a half feet across, and we couldn't do it. What the hell does that prove? <laughs> It doesn't prove anything in a thousand years from now it will barely be mentioned in the history books. But if you were alive at the time, Americans treated it like the ultimate disaster. And we did a whole set of things. National Defense Education Act, foreign language instruction, fucking up mathematics education in our school system, a whole set of positive things that for 10 to 15 years led those test scores to go up, led some positive things to happen in the American economy. Now, I only semi-facetiously sometimes argue that the worst thing to happen in the United States is we got to the moon first. Because well, once again, back to number one, we abolish all those things. We didn't need to do it in the first place because we really weren't inferior as we thought we were in 1957. Now, if you think about the trade deficit in some intrinsic sense, that's much more important than Sputnik. And the question is, could you dramatize it if you were one of the leaders of the United States in such a way that people would be willing to respond to the trade deficit in the same positive way that they were willing to respond to Sputnik? I hope the answer is yes.